Welcome to the A Better Way podcast, where our mission is simple. We want to help restore the joy of sport for parents, coaches, and athletes. This sport journey that can, bring, that can be so beautiful at times has seemed to bring us so much bondage. And if you're listening today, we want to help set you free from that bondage. And we want to help be an encouragement to you as you parent, coach, lead, wherever you're at. If you're a 14-year-old athlete out there, uh, we want to be an encouragement to you. And our goal is simple, man. We want to be a pharmacist of hope today. I believe this. Hope is the most needed prescription in the world today because despair is the most dangerous disease. And so we have with us a special guest today. This guy himself is a pharmacist of hope from ESPN, from Mike and Mike in the morning. Now with Sports Spectrum, our guest today, Mr. Jason Romano. Jason, thanks so much for joining us and calling a timeout in your life. Uh, to be a blessing to us. Yeah, thank he. Thank you for having me, man. This is great. It's an honor to be on with you. And so, in a better way, we believe the family is just so important for the development of our children, for our communities, for our country, and and for this world that that we've been privileged to to be a part of. And so, tell us a little bit about your family, uh, your immediate family. I, I've heard a little bit about your story growing up. Uh, you know, just tell us a, a brief description and, and your family, where you're at now and, and kind of that dynamic. So currently my family is a small one. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Dawn, for 20, it'll be 21 years in a couple months. And, uh, you know, we've had a good marriage. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's always, uh, you know, you always weird. It's weird when you say that because do you stop and let somebody say congratulations? Because yeah. 21 years is a long time. Oh, man. Uh, we're the parents of one daughter. She's 16 in 11th grade, so our family is small, just us three. Um, you know, we walked through four years of infertility and trying to get pregnant when we got married. So, you know, we're blessed to have Sarah. We probably, you know, if the Lord was willing to give us more children, we would have obviously seen that and walked through that, but it didn't happen. Uh, we have one, and we're grateful to have her. She's the best, and I'm honored to be her dad. Um, and that's really where we are now. I have two younger brothers. Uh, my mom and my dad are still alive and, and uh, have, of importance in my life. And uh, my mom had, and dad divorced when I was five. So I don't really remember my parents being together ever. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a funny story when my grandfather passed away in 2007. This is my dad's father, but he was sort of our surrogate father and was, you know, my hero and took care of us growing up. When he passed away, there was a moment where we were at the funeral home with my mom, my dad, and me and my brothers. And, you know, when you're going through grief and, and try to deal with things, sometimes you make stupid jokes to, to kind of, you know, offset the, the grief. And I said, I think this is the first time all five of us have been together with nobody else in my entire life. Oh, and, wow. you know, everybody laughed, but we laughed. But then we talked about it a little bit later. And we're like, yeah, that was kind of a neat moment. Because my mom and dad, I mean, I don't want to say they hated each other, but there was definitely friction and strife going on for many years. So to come together at my grandfather's, you know, funeral arrangements to kind of put it together because my mom stayed close to my grandparents even after they divorced, it was a pretty cool moment. Uh, but we grew up, you know, typical American family, three kids, my mom, you know, divorced mom, worked three jobs to support us. You know, we had a very small house. My brothers, you know, shared a room. I got my own room because I was the oldest. Uh, but we had three bedrooms, very small house, probably a thousand square feet, not not too big. And uh, but we were kids, you know. My my dad, the relationship with him was confusing. Uh, it was hard. It got worse as I got older. But you know, outside of that, my mom really kept us on the straight and narrow and allowed us to have what I would consider a, is a fairly normal childhood just playing sports, going to school, you know, movies, games, things like that, and having friends and just doing the things that normal kids do. Uh, and I credit my mom for that and allowing us really to chase after our dreams because when you have a father who's, you know, not present and, you know, not sober, which we can get into if you want, when he's in that, in that state, um, it's easy to have, uh, you know, sort of a distraction and we could let that temper us. But my mom didn't let that temper us. And she really uh, kept us going and allowed us to experience and to dream and to chase after our dreams. And that's what we did. And thankfully, I was able to do that and turn it into a, you know, a career 
not only at ESPN, but a broadcasting career of 20 plus years now. So t- two things here. One, let's give a shout out to all the moms. Absolutely. Uh, when, when, I was, when I was coaching, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of athletes calling it a grind. I'm like, listen, you're flying on planes. You have unlimited snacks. Like, I get it. There's difficulty involved. But if you were to talk to any of my athletes in my 10 years of coaching uh, at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, they would immediately – I even had a kid going through Navy SEAL training, and he was like, Coach, I heard your voice all the time. Like, this isn't a grind. A single mom working two jobs, raising three kids. Seriously. You know, that's a grind. And so I always want to put things in perspective. The other thing I want to – you 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 said these two words uh, when you were at your grandfather's funeral there. Um, you, you talked about offsetting grief. And, and one of the things I think we even – Speaking of ESPN, you know, there was some stuff with Dak Prescott that went on this week and things like yeah. that. I think it was Dak Prescott with mental illness. And listen, it's real. It's there. Uh, despair doesn't apologize. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't discriminate. Um, you know, but one of the things that, that we often talk about is when we have grief, we usually fight grief one of three ways. So one way we fight pain is with more pain. Mm-hmm. Hey, we dish it back out. You know, the other way we fight pain is with pleasure. Uh, and you talk about alcoholism a lot and things like that. And we go to those things to just, if we can just mask this pain we're feeling momentarily, but the issue is it always takes more. But then the third way is we fight pain with purpose mm-hmm. and we realize it's bigger than us. And so you go from Jason Romano, ESPN, Mike and Mike, and that's who we know, but who is Jason Romano sports spectrum? Like, why are you so passionate about what you're doing now? Well, I'm passionate because, you know, my faith is the most important thing in my life. And, you know, that faith drives me. It's the center of all I am. And it's, it's really what defines my purpose. You know, my purpose was always about Jason for many years. And I would chase after my dreams. And those are good things. Those aren't bad things. You know, climbing the corporate ladder, wanting to be great in my job, wanting to get the promotion, wanting to get the next, you know, role at ESPN or whatever. But when I got to Sports Spectrum and and their overarching ministry, which is owned by Pro Athletes Outreach, I saw a small team cranking out a lot of work, a lot of content, being productive, but I also saw purpose. Mm, Our purpose, it's a great word, and I think it can be saturated or overused a little bit. But for me, you know, my purpose, I think about the book, The Purpose Driven Life. Rick mm-hmm. Warren wrote this book. It's an amazing book about faith and finding our purpose. And the very first line in the book, it says, it's not about you. Mm-hmm. And I believe true purpose in life. When we think about our purpose, what is our purpose? It, in some ways, doesn't include us. It's about something greater, something bigger. And for me, it's about my relationship with God. And then it's about my relationship and my my mindset to serve others Mm -hmm. and in this role my passion and my purpose are intersected in a way that i could never have imagined because i've always had a passion for broadcasting and for media and for radio and, and television and you know any kind of real content creation right so there's a passion there I've always had a passion for sports. I mean, that goes back to being five, six years old and watching games with my dad and my grandfather, uh, obsessed with sports in my teens and my 20s. So I've always had a passion for sports, but now you have a, I have a passion for my faith, a passion for God. And when you can add those three things together, that is a sweet spot of all sweet spots for me. Mm -hmm. And it allows me to live out my purpose in a greater way. You know, to know that the work I'm doing isn't just to entertain someone, which is fine if they listen to this or if they listen to any of the shows or interviews I do, it's fine if they're entertained, but to really walk away, being able to apply what they heard, being able to hear stories that are bigger and deeper than just the surface level sports stuff that we watch all the time on all the different shows. This goes deeper. We go below sea level, if you will, into the real, you know, grind and muck and and dirt and try to go into a place where the purpose is fulfilled and purpose is seen and i think it, when it, when you bring in faith into the conversation it's not for everybody obviously and i understand that but for me as the, the as the most important part of my life 
I get so much joy now being able to provide a platform for others to talk about and share their faith. Man, and, and the passage that comes to my mind is Matthew 10, 39, where Jesus says, hey, whoever finds his life, you know, hey, when you pursue what you think will satisfy, you lose it. You know, it's a, a, a word we use in the sports world all the time. Hey, they got the it factor. You know, we love athletes with the it factor. But then he says, whoever loses his life, whoever will give up on what you think will satisfy and come after me, yeah. actually find it. And, it. and it's really, it's when we get in that sweet spot where we understand our purpose and we're willing to deny ourselves uh, and we're going for it, you really find life and life to the fullest. Uh, mm -hmm. And it prevents us maybe from chasing some of these other things that are just a, a never ending road to more and more and more. And, and, and we see that in the sports world, man, winning can be that addiction can be that, you know, relationships can be fame can be that. And so, man, just grateful for your story and testimony to so many people out there today, because there are so many searching. I love John chapter four, where Jesus encounters this woman at the well, like she goes back and her whole village comes to know Christ. And like, we don't know what our story can do for other people, but here's what we do know. We can tell our story. Right. Uh, and if it's one person, uh, Heath, that is impacted by it and you know that that one person might be changed forever then we have to tell it we have to tell it for the millions or the thousands or the hundreds which is fine if millions and thousands of hundreds of people hear or listen to it but it's about the one mm -hmm. that's the only reason i wrote the first book that i wrote live to forgive because i i have no interest in writing a book about my relationship with my father and forgiving him but when i told the story i saw the one because the one came up to me and said thank you because I needed to hear that you told my story and I wow. needed to know that I wasn't alone. And it's like, Oh, we need to tell our stories. And so I encourage other people now tell your story, even if it's one person, it's worth it. No doubt about it. Well, you, you have been, you've seen athletics at the highest level. I mean, you know, you, you've had one of those jobs that people dream of uh, yeah. in, in a lot of ways you know, so if you could give families, because the sports world today, I mean, it really is, it's, uh, we, we have a book we're working on, working on called The Parent Trap, when the sport world sucks you in, uh, because it, it, no one sets out to let it suck them in that way, no one sets out to break the bank that way, but it will just lure you in, because it's an idol, and I believe the idol today is not even the sports world, I think it's a level deeper, we've even allowed our children to become our idol, Yes. And it, no, no matter how good the idol is, when it's not what it's supposed to be, when it's not love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we create danger. And so you have seen athletes operate at the highest level. You've seen families in those circles. If you could give families any advice as they navigate the journey. So we're talking, to, we're talking to families who are believers in this, in this essence. And maybe they're not believers. But first of all, I would say to all families, don't let sports determine the worth that your child, that you think your child has. So if my daughter, and I, I've, I've experienced this on a, on a moderate level with my daughter. She didn't play any sports really till 10 years old. And she played softball. First time she ever played any kind of a sport was softball when she was 10. And she was pretty good initially. She actually ended up being the best player on the team and made the all-star team, having never played softball before. And it was, again, fourth, fifth grade. So it's, 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 a, it's a low level. But I would not really watched her in a competitive environment outside of a church basketball league, which she played in, which we were, you know, it was a, a faith-based league called Upward, and we were yeah, kind of yeah. watching it, you know, Upward, yeah. So we were, it's, it's a different environment there, although yeah. it can get a little bit crazy there too. But yeah, yeah. in the softball world, this was Little League softball, and um, you saw it even at 10 years old, and I saw it, where if my daughter was called out when she was safe or she was a catcher, so she framed a strike and the umpire called a ball, and I wasn't coaching. This is when I was just a fan. I would look at my wife and like, how does he miss that? What is wrong? With, like, I get really cynical, but I also put my sports fandom on. Like, I'm watching oh, a man. game on Sunday, and there is the Cowboys, my favorite football team, blowing a lead or something. I'd be like, there we go again. They're blowing a yeah, lead. So yeah. I get into cynical Jason, and I looked at my wife, and she just looked at me. She, was, she goes, you need to be quiet. You need to stop, 
and you need to just enjoy that your daughter's playing a sport. Oh and man, I want to hug so, your wife right now. Oh, you need to hug her because she, yeah. she was spot on. And I said, no, I, I don't want to. They get it. They're, they're ruining her because they called that ball. That should have been a strike, oh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, but then I, I stopped for a second. And I'm like, honey, you're right. And listen, did I, does that mean that I got it perfect going forward? Of course not. I did end up coaching her for a couple of years and that helped me mask <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. the opinions because I was a coach and I could sort of have that permission to say something if I'd yeah. felt that way. But I, I got so much joy out of watching her play softball and compete. And, and there were times where politics were involved or coaches were involved and I would be like, no, why are you doing this? She doesn't want to do that. There was always that. I think it happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. but the times where I could just watch her compete and have fun and she was not the best player and she'll openly admit that. And she doesn't work like, like she's obsessed with being like a division one so softball player. That's just yeah. not who she is. That's not who she's wired. And I'm okay with that. I can't force her. I've said this from the day my wife and I started talking about even high school sports, where she played high school softball. She played high school volleyball. She's good. She's not great. And she doesn't work at it to the point where she wants to be great. Mm -hmm. And I said to my wife, we have to be okay with good. And let's just enjoy the fact that she's doing this and let's go and let's watch her and let's let her be good. And, and my wife and I are both driven and so it'll be like, Sarah, if you just, you know, you, you have these opportunities, go to a camp, go work out, go hit some balls on your time off instead of, you know, playing on your phone. And she doesn't necessarily want to. And I'm like, okay, well, we can't force her. She'll understand mm -hmm. later on. Maybe she would have thought that she could have. We just want to tell her, explain to her, you know, say, here's what we think. And then you make the decision. And if that's how she wants to do it, then that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think we become so obsessed where, you know, we watch our kids in a game or in an event and we think, you know, they could be so much better or, you know, my coach isn't giving my kid enough playing time and she's clearly a better player. I'm, I can't imagine being a coach, you know, oh, on the level that you were, Heath. And oh, thinking, we could talk for hours. Parents coming, you know, why isn't my kid getting more playing time? I, I, I get it. I get it. And coaches are players, I should say, you know, especially on a college level or higher, there's an investment factor mm -hmm. in that. And I, I understand real. it. And it's very real. It's real. But I've also met a lot of coaches, I'm sorry, a lot of parents, especially athletes, high level performance athletes, like former football players, former basketball players. When I ask them about walking through the lens of their son or daughter playing a high level sport, mm -hmm. most of them have just made a decision to back off and let the coach be the coach. They're not the coach. That's right. And so that's kind of, on a, again, a smaller level for me. That's kind of how I've done it with my daughter. Like, I don't know volleyball. Like, the coach knows volleyball. I know basketball. I know baseball. I know football. I don't know volleyball. Mm -hmm. So I don't try to be her coach for volleyball. Do I wish she played more sometimes? Sure, of course. But if she doesn't play at all and her team wins, I'm still going to be there. I'm still going to support. And I'm going to high-five those who do get to play. Yeah. And try to be the best teammate you can be. I'm not even yeah. sure if I answered your question here. No, so, so I want to examples I've seen. Two words here, because I think these words are powerful. And, yeah. and I want to liberate you and your wife, because in the Esslinger household, there were two brothers, myself and I have an older brother. And mm -hmm. so my older brother was more like your daughter, man. He played sports. He was a state placer in high school wrestling. Like, you know, was going to miss two days over Christmas to go hunting with my dad and take the punishment. It just was, it, it was what it was. Yep. He enjoyed it, but it wasn't his life. Then came Heath and it became my life. I loved it. I was all in. I want to do this at a high level. And, and it worked for me. Yeah. Here's the beauty though. And, and my wife would say she married the wrong Esslinger. <laughs> she married the muscles. My sister-in-law married the money. So my brother went on, got a chemistry degree went to dental school, specialized in pediatric dentistry and owns 11 offices now and has a lake house and a wakeboard boat and all these different things. And so he, here's, here's what I want to challenge parents out there with. We can get so caught up in the great. Jim Collins wrote a book, Good to Great. It's, it's an awesome book. It's super popular. But oftentimes great is dangerous. Uh, and, and I have yes. some friends at 3D Coaching and, and the things they talk about, you know, one of the things we always talk about is great is the evaluation of what we do. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jason Romano works at ESPN. He's on Mike right. and Mike. Right. Good is the essence of what we do. And so as we parent our children on the, on this journey, oftentimes we can get caught up in the great because we feel like it's a validation of us. 
but really it's the good we're cultivating that becomes the validation. And one of the most unfortunate things we see in the sports world today, Jason, is because we go so all in on skill development and strength and I mean, these kids today, it's unbelievable. These 13 and 14 year old kids. I, I wouldn't have made it today. I would have been passed over. You know, people wouldn't have thought you could have started that late. But kids today have gifts and skills that are getting them to a room that their character won't allow them to stay. And yes. it's devastating. It's yeah. devastating. And so for those of you out there that are parents, you know, we don't get to pick where they end up, but we do get to pick the foundation in which we lay. Uh, and so no matter where your kid's out there, man, focus on those good qualities. And even, even spiritually speaking, when God created the universe, here's what he said. He didn't say this is great. He said this is good. And the word good in scripture means approved or stamped by God. And so as you look at your role as a parent, like I, I just want, and my, I have three, I have four kids, three daughters, they're playing volleyball and all sorts of things. But people ask, people ask me like, you don't get caught up in it. I'm like, because I know how fleeting it is. Yes. Like I want to cultivate the good. This will never set them free. Even if they get a full ride, it will not set them free. And so encourage, cool. encourage the good for all you parents out there. Yeah, it's so well said. And that's why I think I focus now on telling people, especially younger people, and it's hard to tell your own kid, first of all. Like, oh, it's so hard. When I've coached my daughter, <laughs> I, we had some, we battled because she I won't do she it. St she still saw me as dad. And I was an assistant coach, not a head coach, yeah. but she still saw me as dad. And when I would coach her, she was hearing dad. She wasn't hearing coach. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard for her to turn off dad and to see me or hear me as I'm a coach now and I'm trying to coach you. I'm not trying to yell at you or tell you that you need to do more dishes or clean up your room. Like this is coaching. And we had a battle there, but I'm going to go into the word identity for a minute because we, it's, a, it's a cliche word, especially in the Christian world. But in the sports world, it's the number one struggle for athletes on all levels, including the ones I talk to, which are mostly professional and college, high-level college, also coaches. Anyone who's a high achiever, identity is a giant struggle because we get so caught up and consumed in our value being found in what we do mm. and what we accomplish. And in the sports world, if you haven't played, if you sat the bench and your team won, those players often look at that as an identity issue of failure because they didn't get a chance. Right. And even for me, you know, there were moments where I got caught up trying to chase the dream and chase the next level and chase the new job and the promotion at ESPN. And I didn't get it. And I was crushed. And I said, Oh my gosh, how am I going to be able to continue whatever? And my identity, my focus is found in what I did, mm. but Christ is so beautiful. And when he came to this earth and said, listen, I came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Mm -hmm. Our identity is not found in our accomplishments. It's found in who Christ says we are, number That's right. one, but it's found in what we do for others. Mm -hmm. To me, the great leaders, and I write about this in my book, the great leaders are those who serve. In fact, I wouldn't even call you a leader if you don't serve. Yes. If you're not a person who's out there to serve, if you're in it for yourself, then you're not a real good leader. You might be a boss. You might be the best player, the best coach. But if you're not there to serve others and make your teammates better and make those around you better and to be there for them and to care for them, then I would reckon you're not a leader uh, or a very good one. And I think that stems all the way down to what we're talking about with parents and, and players and, and their kids too is, man, when you, when you, you want to give the best to your kids. We all do. I want to be a better dad to my daughter than my dad was to me. I want to give my daughter things and opportunities that I never had. I think that's every parent's desire. So if she wants to play sports and do travel ball and things like that, I want to pr provide that for her where I didn't do anything like that when I was a kid. However, if she has a bad day, or if that's taken from her, is she going to be okay? Meaning, and we would have this conversation, she's wrestling now because wrestling with the idea of, not the sport of wrestling, but wrestling <laughs> with the idea, that would be interesting. She's yeah. wrestling with the idea of playing two sports at the same time mm -hmm. because there's travel softball and there's high school volleyball. Mm -hmm. And we said to her, 
you're not all in on really any of this. You love it and you want to play it and you have to be in once you, de- once you, once you declare or once you, you know, decide and they put you on the team, you're in. But I don't think too, like we would say, do you really think you can carry two sports right? Like, she's like, dad, I really don't want to. And we go, okay, then you're not playing two sports. That's your call. Yes. If you did, we would do our best to help you. But we also have to remember, and we just have one. Like I think about you or my brothers, they all have multiple kids. My brothers both have it's crazy. four plus kids. And it's yeah. like, how do you balance all that? And they're all pretty close in age. So we just have the one. It's easier for us. But we have to be there to support her and understand and teach her. This is how I do it with my kid. That her value is not in anything that she accomplishes, even her schoolwork. And we oh, want her to be preach, a preach, great preach, preach. student. Preach. We want, I want her, my, my wife's probably harder on her than I am, but we want her to be a great student. We want her to apply it herself. We want her to work hard, be excellent. You know, it says in Colossians to be excellent in all that we do as unto the Lord. But that's just not the case sometimes with kids. However, I always said to my daughter, just care about what you're doing. And she had a, a tougher year in her sophomore year in high school where her grades were all in the mid 90s. They were low 90s or whatever. It's like, come on. I, I had a 79 average when I graduated high school. But let's not go crazy and think about, like you said, things that are fleeting. I hate to say it. These kids need to go to school and learn. But these grades, this, this time, is, it's, it's important for them. They should enjoy it, cherish it. But it's fleeting. It's, it's fleeting. So fleeting. I don't care. As I mean, Paul would say, it's perishable. It's perishable. Yeah. Yes. And the only thing that isn't is the rock that is Christ. And we, yeah. if we don't put our firm foundation and our identity on him, everything else is like, what does it say? Sink in sand, right? We're just going to sink. And I, I love, uh, man, I love what George Bush gave a commencement speech one time. And he's, so he's talking to all these graduates and he says, hey, for all of you that are magna cum laude, you know, well done. For all of you that are summa cum laude, congrats. And to all of you who are C students, you too can be president. And so, Absolutely. you know, it, but it's, you know, the academic world can be just like the sports world where yes. we place so much premium on the performance. And again, I believe it goes back to we as a family are in an identity crisis. Uh, I was just doing, I did a podcast last week with the associate director for the New York State Athletic Directors Association. Okay. And man, he dropped this truth bomb on me. I, I made him say it twice. One of the things that we teach, so we teach two main principles. One, don't get so consumed with what matters now. You lose sight of what matters most. Mm-hmm. All right. Just keep like, hey, when the eight-year-old game seems so big, take a deep breath, focus on the journey. And then the second thing is our role as parents is not to provide all the best opportunities. Yeah. It's to discern what are the right opportunities. Mm-hmm. Listen, Tim Elmore says, abundance can be just as dangerous as abandonment. I mean, man, that's so you, true. Oh, it's so true. I was coach. I was just talking about it yesterday with a college basketball coach. Uh, two issues two. I mean, both opposite ends of the spectrum, same outcome. But one of the things that Jim Wright from um, New York said, he said, you know, Heath, one of the things we're seeing is used to, we had so many status symbols as a family the house you lived in, the car you drove, the job you had. And he, he goes, in our society today, there are differences, but you go to the Little League field and everyone's driving an SUV. Mm-hmm. Everyone's using an iPhone. So the only thing we have to leverage our worth is our child's performance. And so yeah. we get so wrapped up in it because the only thing that makes me a better parent than the Romanos is, hey, Brooke outplayed Sarah. Right. We, we can yeah. allow that to crush us and it can crush our children. And so I always challenge coaches and parents, change the scoreboard. If the only thing we're measuring is outcomes, well, then that's what we're going to validate ourselves on. But we have to change the scoreboard. And so even as a parent, when I go to games, I'm looking for coaches and players who are doing the intrinsic little things that no one else is paying attention to. And I'm going to point them out. Like, I will go over to a family and say, I just want you to know how, how awesome it was to see your daughter do this on the court. Because what gets rewarded gets repeated. Mm-hmm. And so we have to catch kids doing those things right that we actually know can liberate them. Uh, and we, we, you have to have a strategy. I mean, you have yeah. to have a strategy. Well, that's why right now, I mean, you know, high school kids, uh, I mean, all kids really, but the, uh, 
the worth and value of a high school kid is found in likes on social media. Have and you seen many, the social media dilemma on Netflix? I haven't watched Netflix. it yet, and I, I oh, got to watch it's it. It's disturbing. I heard it's disturbing, it, and I'm not it will crush sure you. if I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah I wasn't I, ready. Uh, I do want to watch it, but I don't, I mean, I live it a little bit because I, I mean, I had a job in social media for yeah, five yeah. years at ESPN. I was running social media channels and, you know, I would use that as a fake excuse to be on social media all the time, mm. but I loved it. I loved being on Facebook, especially Twitter. And, uh, you know, I still like being on there, but I watch and, and, and for some, on some level, adults go through this too, but especially the teens who post pictures wait for the comments which are mostly you look beautiful you look awesome and you know if they don't get a certain amount of likes they delete the picture oh because it's God. it's a comparison maybe this is all found in the in the documentary too but i watch through the lens of my daughter and, and her friends on instagram and i see it and i'm like gosh i hope that she's okay if you know, Instagram went away. Just thinking about the worth and value that these kids place on pictures and it's not even real world. And, you know, my daughter, I think I'm thankful that she's not gotten caught up in partying and things mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, she might have that yeah. praying she doesn't, but she might have that moment in college. We'll, we'll hope not and pray and yeah. believe God won't, won't let her. But I also think you, you want to fail. You want to let your kids fail yeah. to some level so that they can learn. I mean, I failed so I could learn. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes when I was 18 to 22 uh, and even before that, but more when I got on my own, I had to learn the hard way on a lot of different things. And, but I watch her and I'm like, I, I praise her. And, and, and there's times where she'll feel like she's getting made fun of and you know, because she doesn't partake or do certain things. And I, I watch it and I say, no, 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 this is, I want you to know that this is, this is okay. You know, and I, I'm speaking to her from a, from a person of a, of a dad who loves his daughter, but also from a follower of Christ. Like we are yeah. called to be sought and light in this world, but to look different. That's right. We are not called to be conformed to the patterns That's of right. this world. And my daughter knows that. And does she get conformed? Of course. Do I? Of yes. course. Yeah. However, that scripture is in her mind. She knows Romans 12 too. Yeah. And she knows that what that means. And somewhere along the lines, I believe that that will be a, a seed that, that sprouts, but it's hard and you watch it. And I have to consistently remind her and, and, and encourage her and affirm her that it's okay to, to be different. You know, and not to be weirdly. I mean, listen, everybody's all kids are weird. Yeah, and I'm you know, weird. It, it's it's okay to even yeah. be weirdly different if you want yeah. to dye your hair pink and walk yeah. around and whatever. But be true to yourself. But remember, uh, who God called you to be. You know, and that's it's hard. Teenage years are hard. I cannot imagine Heath being a teenager. Like I have when three I teenage daughters right now. Right, and I have one. And I, I can't imagine having two more. And I certainly can't imagine being a teenager in this 2020 world where, you know, I struggled enough in 1990 being a teenager. Yeah. I can't imagine 30 years later what this is like, you know? You know, we did an event a few years ago with Kate Fagan from ESPN. You know, Kate, she worked at ESPN. She, I do uh, know. She I don't know her well, but I know who she is. She did the yeah. documentary on the girl from UFPN who... Yes, committed suicide. And, and I want to tell you, man, like it was absolutely alarming. And, and you look at from a social status standpoint, everything that the world would say would bring you fulfillment was present. Mm -hmm. Vision one athlete, Ivy league school, super smart, unbelievably beautiful, great family, all of these things present, complete emptiness. Yeah. Because the social media, it, and, and it, it's, it's what makes coaching hard today and being an athlete hard because you are so quickly able to compare what you're doing to what everyone else is doing. And I love sure. what Paul says. He goes, you want to know the secret of life? Contentment. Yeah. Contentment is the secret, man. And so it's just when you're 14, I can't even do it at 43. I know. I mean, I and know. I'm asking my 15-year-old daughter and my 13-year-old daughters and to do it, and it's just so hard. And so – Man, to all of our listeners out there who are parents, and it is our passion, and, and Jason's a parent, and uh, man, it is so hard, but don't give up. 
we have got to fight for the hearts of our children. We have to. I completely agree. And, you know, really just start by loving them where they're yeah. at. No matter what they've done, no matter where their grades are, no matter how much they're playing or not playing, no matter if they're on social media, well, they just love them and be present, be intentional yes. about being present. That was one thing I missed with my I father. struggle there. Yeah. And, and same yeah. here. You know, I travel a lot, at least I did before the pandemic. And so I would be away three, four, five days at a time, mm -hmm. once a month or once every other month. And that was hard. It was easier as my daughter got older because she was older and she didn't need me every single second like she did before she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm home, I'm going to be present. Even this morning, taking her to school. Uh, she's only going a couple days a week now because of the pandemic. But in the days that she's going, I said, let me take you to school because we don't talk a whole lot in the car, you know, teenage daughters. Oh gosh. Yeah. Just you never know when they wake up in the morning. You just don't know. And today <laughs> was one of those days, but it still gives me 20 minutes, just me and her. And I'll start conversations, talk about sports, whatever, yeah. but it's being present. You know, my dad was not around for me. He was, he was around. I shouldn't, I should say he was around, but he wasn't present. And I missed him being present in my life. And that's really all I've ever focused on and dedicated to doing as a dad to my daughter was to be in her life and to be there and to, for her to know that when she needs me, and Dawn is the same way, my wife, when, they, when she needs us and she needs us more than she realizes, I think yeah. as a teenager, we're there for her 100%. We got her back. No matter what she does, we got her back. I can remember dagger in my heart. My son, he was probably four years old. I was coaching and, you know, they say you can never turn it off. I think it's a lie. I think you have to turn it off at times if you value mm -hmm. your family. But I can remember my son was going to bed and I was going to tuck him in and he goes, dad, you know, come tuck me in. You can bring your phone with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, man. And, he and so that. like yeah. the same thing we're getting onto our children for, we are almost doing and uh, man, I just read a book. I want to share this with you just to be a personal. Uh, it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I have it. It's up here. I just read it too. Oh it, my gosh, man. Challenged the heck out of me. <laughs> Dude, I, I deleted all my social media from my phone. Like, you know, I'm only checking. You go. Oh man. For yep. you listeners out there, John Mark Comer, The Ruthless yep. Elimination of Hurry. Um, such a liberating book. I mean, challenging, but uh just made so much. I mean, I'm listening to this going, he nails it. Yeah. I want to do the same thing. I started with Facebook off my phone, yeah. but I also do social media for my job. So it's hard because there's moments in sports that happen when I'm not right in front of my laptop, but I I'm looking forward to the day. And I told my bosses this to where I can delete Twitter and Instagram from my phone as well. And I like going on them. I really do. Like oh, I, I enjoy love it social media, I do too. but I need to eliminate hurry. And, uh, this book is such a good book, the ruthless elimination of hurry. I underlined it. I need to go back and read it again, to be quite honest with you, Oh, because there was so much in it and I underlined it. And, um, you know, it's just, it's hard though. Cause we get so caught up and society says, no, be on your phone all the time. Yes. I mean, how did even today, as we record this, Apple's announcing their new iPhones, right? Yeah. That they're going to put out and people are going to stand in line or whatever they do now, I guess, yeah. order online to get the latest and greatest iPhone, which just came out a year ago. And the one before <laughs> that was a year ago, but it's because we've created in our minds, the can't miss. We have to have the latest and greatest. And what that does though, is it, completely does the opposite of ruthlessly elimination, eliminating hurry. It actually increases the hurry, increases the busyness and crazes our mind up. And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of it. So I'm saying uh, it from sorry. experience. <laughs> yes. And so all we can do, you know, put some boundaries up and that's what we say in the sports world. Like, you know, as you begin the sports journey as a family, just create some boundaries because it'll suck you in. If you predetermine yeah. those boundaries, uh, you know, boundaries are there to limit us. I want to add this to Heath for me. One of the, one of the non-negotiables for the most part, we, we, I think we might've missed one or two was church. Yeah. We were not going to let sports stop us from going to church together as a family for many, many years. And there were occasional times where she had softball games or volleyball practices on Sundays. And every once in a while, as long as she went to youth group Saturday night, she could miss mm -hmm. if it was one of those important practices mm -hmm. or whatever. But we told our coaches, listen, if she has a game, and we can't get to church on Saturday night or Sunday at second service or whatever, like we're going to church. And that was mm -hmm. very hard for the coach to hear 
very hard for Sarah to accept because her friends weren't doing that. Yes. But that was one of those non-negotiables that we pushed through as much as we could. Now, again, we weren't right on every level and we didn't get it right, but that was one of those non-negotiables. And that's one of, so in our faith-based parenting course called Putting Sport in its Proper Perspective, we talk about three boundaries, a financial boundary. Listen, Chad Esslinger, they call him Dr. Esslinger. They called me Coach Esslinger. We didn't live in the same kind of house. That doesn't make me a bad dad. It just makes right. our circumstances different. So you create a financial boundary. Yes. Then you create a family boundary. Like one of the things I see, and obviously you have one child, but you still operate in a family unit is we make decisions based on one kid. And I always tell people, make a family. What's the best for your family? Like there's times we say no to one kid because of another child, because right. I'm here to, to lead our family, not one kid in volleyball. But the third one is a faith boundary. And, and what we say is you have to decide how often and how early you're going to forsake gathering together. I'm not a legalist. You can right. we miss church for vacation at times. You know what I mean? But when you start missing 20 something weeks a year for eight year old softball, then you tell your kid one of two things, either they are God or softball is God, mm -hmm. both of which will royally let them down. And so, you know, so determining true. those boundaries and going, Hey, this is just our non-negotiables. Yeah. Uh, and what we've seen is, Hey, if coaches want you, they'll let you, they'll, they'll go for it. And sometimes other families will even say, well, Hey, we're, we're going to church too. Um, you know, we've just almost, we, again, we've just bought this lie that the enemy's selling us. So, Hey, real quick, I, I know your time's valuable and man, I could talk to you all day long. We'll have to do another one, but <laughs> absolutely. You know, t two last questions of, of the people you've met, who's left a lasting impact on impact on you in regards to family who out there from a, like, make me a fan of someone. Well, I'm going to, it's, it's not anybody that you've heard of, but my brother, to be quite oh, honest, my dude, brother, I'm Chris, honest, um, I have two younger brothers. Um, my brother, Chris is the one who led me to Christ in 2001 and, uh, the first in our family to become a Christian, uh, and begin a walk with Christ. And he's the father of five kids. He's got four. I'm praying for you, Chris. <laughs> well, he's got four biological and it started boy, girl, boy, girl. And then they adopted a baby girl, uh, two years ago who was, not in their plans to adopt, but was on the verge of being aborted. And uh, he, he saved this child in essence, him and his wife, Tara, my sister-in-law. Um, but I've learned how to love. I've learned how to be a dad. I've learned how to be a better man, a better Christian, a uh, communicator, because he's a preacher and he's a Bible um, president, professor. He teaches. He's the best teacher I know. He knows more about the Bible than anybody I know. The only flaw he has is that he's a Philadelphia Eagles fan <laughs> and I'm a we Dallas Cowboys fan, but he's my brother and I love him. And he's my hero. I tell people that. And you know, if and you, he's, he's on Twitter and Instagram, like CJ Romano 21, I think is his handle, but he's not on there too often, but I, I, I could talk to him about anything and I need that person in my life. He happens to be my brother and I'm thankful for that, but I can also just watch him and be better because I'm watching him. I, I tell people I would never have began a relationship with Christ if it wasn't for watching how my brother walked as a Christian before I said yes to Christ. And Cause I wasn't interested in faith, honestly, but I watched him and I said, well, he loves differently than he loved before. He treats his family, treats his wife and you know, his newborn son differently. There's a, there's an aura an aroma, as the Bible says, wow. of Christ that came from my brother that Dude, I, I watched that. and I wanted, I wanted that. I didn't necessarily know I wanted Christ. I wanted what my brother had and uh, he walked me through and led me to the Lord. But still to this day, I just saw him a couple days ago. I watch him in action and I see a guy, it's like, man, how do you do that? Cause I, I would have lost it and, uh, or I would have not performed well in that situation or I would have how do we how do you have patience here how do you continue to have joy when you're going through this and uh and he's just a wonderful example so Christopher Romano that's the guy wow and and for all of our listeners out there man it's so easy for us to put people on a pedestal based on public performance and right uh man I, I may hurt your feelings here but I, I have this theory and it's just a theory there's some okay. research to back it up but so I talk about the downward spiral of the sports world and I, I go back to 1976 and 1976 is where we were introduced to this. Da, 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 da. And 
we, the sports world became all about the highlight, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, ESPN doesn't show the carnage of every family that tried and didn't make it. And that's not a knock on them. Listen, I love the guys at ESPN and they were so good to the sport of wrestling and, um, you know, but as a family, we can become so enamored with the temporal yeah. uh, that we lose sight of the eternal. And, and one, I, I'm on this kick the past few weeks about, you know, we talk about leadership so much and leadership really starts with followership. That was Jesus's model. Hey, you want to know this life? Follow me. Yeah. And um, man, so for all of you parents out there, it's all about who you surround yourself with. So as you lead your children, surround yourself with a, with an inner circle uh, that values the eternal, uh, that doesn't get caught up in this moment that will fade so quickly. And, um, as hard as it is, it's easier when you have like-minded people around you. So to Chris Romano, I want to say kudos, shout out to you of all the people your brother could have picked. Uh, he picks you. So man, grateful for that. Um, as a husband and father yourself, what legacy do you want to leave in your own family? Uh, as a husband, I want to love my wife well. And uh, that's one thing I've, I still worked on. It's 21 years. Uh, there are days when I do not love my wife well uh, or the way that she deserves to be loved, but I try to. And, um, you know, it's almost you get so comfortable around the same person for 20 years. You feel like you can act or be a certain way. And it's just like, well, this is just who I am. But it still requires some work and some effort to right. continue to love the person that you've been with even for so many years. So for my legacy as a husband, that's what I want to do. I want it when I'm gone. And if I die before my wife, I want them to say he loved his wife. Well, uh, okay. as a dad, my desire for my child, and I've said this, and I even think about, it gets me a little emotional when I think about it is I want her to love the Lord, her God with all of her, love the Lord, her God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength and love her neighbor as herself. Like I want her to live a life that is pleasing to God, that honors God, that has Christ at the center of her life. If she does that, I honestly don't care whatever else she does. She could be a homemaker. She could work at That's Walmart. Right. She could be the president of the United States. She could be the best division one softball catcher in the history of whatever. I don't care about any of that. But if she is walking with Christ all the days of her life, she marries a godly husband, Lord, hear that prayer for me. Yes, please. That's I'm the S that's, household too. <laughs> that's my desire is for her to just love Jesus with all of her heart for the rest of her life. And I really don't care about anything else. I think everything else, like it says in Matthew 6, will fall into place. Uh, and so if I if she does that, I will have considered myself, you know, a successful, if you want to look at that word, a successful father and parent. I mean, how crazy is it? And we all get, we all get sucked into this trap and but what if what if just and for those of you out there listening maybe you're listening and you're a believer and you're sold out you're following after christ uh, maybe you're on the struggle bus man been there done that uh you know maybe you don't know christ right. but what if we had a shift like this and i believe that we're that we can see a great awakening happening and i truly believe we're going to see it through the sports world uh 100 because it's the thing we worship uh, yeah. and so what if even just those of us who are believers, if we really did make that our mission, if, if our child loving the Lord, their God, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and teaching them to love their neighbor as their self yes. was our top priority. It wasn't softball. Hey, she's not playing as much. I don't care. She loves the Lord or God. Hey, she, she, maybe she got done wrong. You know what I mean? Some friends treated her bad. Hey, guess what? She like, I believe we would see an entire culture shift if we would sell out the way that God really wants us to. And he promises us like it's better that way, but he yes. definitely still buys the lie. I buy yeah. the lie, Jason Romano. So we all uh, do. We all do my brother. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard. Um, but like I said, honestly, that's the well done, good and faithful servant line, right? Like really yeah. if, if we just pursue God and, I take all of this away, take this podcast, take my show, take this house, take the car. I mean, I'm really at the point in my mid forties now where I'm just like, if you take it all away, Lord, I, I want to still just worship you because you'll make a way. Right. And, you know, I don't necessarily pray for Job moments in my life. Yeah, I'm sure you know yeah. what I mean by that. Oh yeah. But 
if it's all taken away, like that's okay. It's, it's all fleeting. And I want to, I want to be able to die saying, okay, Lord, I just, I, I loved you and I pursued you and I failed many times and I needed that grace. I needed that repentance, that forgiveness, but I just want to pursue you. And, um, that's where purpose is found. I really believe it. Hey, if we could pray for one thing for you in regards to like next step, sports spectrum, whatever, like, man, how, how can we, how can we do that for you? How can we be a blessing to you? So this is interesting. I, I working in ministry is wonderful. I get to work and tell people about Jesus every day, but there are days where my ministry replaces my personal relationship with God. And that's not healthy. That's making a really good thing. God, a God thing. And, uh, you know, my, my ministry, my job, my role with sports spectrum is not my relationship with God. And I sometimes can just say, well, I just did three interviews and we talked about Jesus. Uh, isn't that good enough or whatever? And I let that sometimes replace the relationship aspect, the day-to-day -day daily time that I need to spend with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's the prayer maybe is to just, uh, pray that the spirit moves enough to where, and I've, I've worked on this and I, I make efforts every morning. I wake up at five 30 and that's my time with the Lord. But there's times where if I pick up my phone or if I sit in front of my laptop, I could be so consumed with work that I, I almost forget to stop and remember that I need to talk to my Lord and Savior first and not talk about the Lord and Savior. And so the prayer is for that, to just continue to be seeking God first, not seeking the things of God first. And one, of, one of my mentors always says, we can get so busy doing the work of God that we miss the God of the work. And uh, hey, there, there's a there's That's a so great good. there's a great. Can book. you say that again? Say hey, that again. we get so busy, Robert Green. Uh, we get so busy doing the work of God that we miss the God of the work. Oh, and, uh, so hey, a, a, a guy I met today, I was doing a podcast with him. He actually showed me this book on the screen a minute ago called "The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry." It actually <laughs> talks a little bit about <laughs> what another guy uh, a few minutes later was just talking about as well. So hey, one of the things I had a guy challenge me. He calls it NTT, no technology time. So I, I'm like you, man. Like this thing is just so addicting, man. It's just so tempting. I, I th This is not very spiritual, but in that social media <laughs> dilemma, the guy said, hey, the question is, uh, it, it's, hey, do you check your phone while you pee or you b before you pee? But it's one of those two. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, that is embarrassing. Like, uh, no. guilty. And so what I've been doing is I get up and I do not turn my phone or computer on because yeah. it's an immediate distraction. Well, let uh, me tell you what I do. I, I leave my phone downstairs uh, no charging sleep. in the kitchen and I go to bed and I do have my Apple watch. I sleep with my watch and it's not because of the connection to, I just like waking up and seeing what time it is because yeah. I can't see without my glasses. So I keep, I sleep with my watch and Sarah said, well, what if somebody calls you in the middle of the night and something happens on your cell? I said, well, my watch will ring. And I said, if I don't answer, what will they do? They'll keep calling. That's what you do in an emergency. Yeah. And eventually you answer it. But I, keep, I need to keep my phone downstairs. My daughter thinks I'm crazy. Dad, why would you do that? I said, I need to do that for my health. That's right. The other thing oh. is we, don't, we, don't, we try not to, especially when she was younger and even more now, I think we're not as disciplined, but we still do it is no phones at dinner. Um, you know, it's a small time. It's 15 minutes. You know, we talk at dinner, we play jeopardy on the Alexa that we have, you know, it's just a game that we can play together yeah. and kind of bond over, but we play that on the, on the Alexa app and eat dinner and just have a moment for us for 15 minutes without phones, without, you know, crazy things coming at us, TVs, whatever. And again, small, small things, but they've helped us, I think in our relationships, man. As a parent, fight for those moments. It is so hard. And from Heath Esslinger and Jason Romano, I hope today in no way, shape, or form you feel like we're talking at you, we're talking with you. Uh, as Paul said, hey, I'm the chief of all sinners, but I do want to do it better. Um, yeah. I want to do it better. And, uh, man, from A Better Way Athletics, Jason, thanks so much. Thanks for encouraging me today. You were a uh, pharmacist were of hope in my life today. So uh, thanks so much. If you want to know more about parent education, you can go to abetterwayathletics.com. Our passion is simple. We do want to help restore the joy of sport for parents, coaches, and athletes. So if you're an individual family and, and want to jump on, you can click on virtual training and find it at our website. If you're an athletic director, 
a sport organ organization director, a governing body, we can make that available to everyone. We believe this. There's two powerful influences in the life of our kids. One is the parent. The other is the coach. And leadership is all about alignment. And when those two powerful influences are pulling in opposite directions, there's one person that suffers, and that's that child we say we care so much about. So check us out. Follow us on social media. I'm not going to be on there on my phone, uh, but I'm, I'm going to send some stuff out each week at the beginning of the week. And I have a guy actually helping me now, you know, use my social media because, again, it's addictive to me. And so yeah. wherever you're at on this journey, we want to be a help. So thanks so much for tuning in today, Jason Romano. Thank you so much for being an encouragement to us.